1945 Domaine de la Romani Conti, Romani Conti. Welcome. You're in for a treat today because I'm here with Warren Porter, president of Iron Gate Wine. They're Canada's premier purveyor of everything wine, from retail to storage to inventory management. Warren, thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me. So Warren, I think there's something universal about wine that transcends cultures, geographical boundaries and the like. So like myself, I'm sure everyone watching is looking forward to you sharing your stories from sure. decades long experience in the wine industry. But first, I think it's appropriate that we uncook a bottle of wine sure. since we're having a conversation about wine. Always better to have run around a, if not a meal, a conversation for sure. So I'll tell you what I'm going to open up. Um, yes. It, this is a 2011 white Bordeaux. It's summer. So we're going to get off the reds for a little bit. We've got a nice chilled white Bordeaux. I really, really like white Bordeaux. Uh, this one uh, I, I was mentioning I had found in Vancouver and I really, really liked it. It's uh, called the Lazot de Smith, uh, which is the second bottling of Smith on the feet. Uh, it's a Sauvignon Semillon. Uh, and we don't, uh, in Ontario, get a heck of a lot of uh, white Bordeaux. And so when I find them uh, in my travels, I like to bring them back. This one I found, as I mentioned, when I was out west, and I really liked it. So we went around and found everything they had in these number of stores and brought them all home with us. So okay. hopefully you like it. And um, where would you say this wine bottle sits in terms of that? natural progression uh, of someone's palate, for instance, if, if the start is uh, sweet and fruity. So I think this wine would fit across a, a broad range of palates because it's interesting enough for someone who's got a, a depth of knowledge in wine. It's terrific quality, but, uh, but it's also, uh, it's got enough um, uh, uh, fruit and, uh, and nose to it that people uh, will appreciate it who don't have a great experience in wine. So for example, uh, I poured it uh, for my sister at her birthday in Vancouver. She's certainly not a connoisseur and it quickly became one of her favorite wines. Okay, so I'm excited to try it. She was very upset when I took the only four cases out of Vancouver. <laughs> right it's got a nice color to it as well. It's got 10 years on it, so it's, it would have been a lot lighter when it came out. Okay. Uh, but now it's got a little... You know what you know, I'll show you to do? If you want to get that out, you want to swirl it, but put it on the table so you don't spill it. Okay. Okay, so swirl it on the table. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Beautiful bottle. Perfect button. summer wine. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. okay. Yep. Let's jump right in. Let's do it. Let's start with where it all began. How was the idea of Iron Gate Wine born and how did it come to fruition? Sure, so um, we, I was looking at building a, a self-storage facility, right? Like public storage or, or whatever. And in learning that business, I saw the business of wine storage and it seemed more interesting to me, obviously. So we wound up uh, pursuing the business uh, planning for self-storage, but I started a wine storage place just as a separate side project and then smash cut to 17 years later and it's everything that we do. So when uh, you, you're talking about storage can you elaborate on what the ideal conditions are for storing wine? Sure. In terms of like temperature, humidity, light? Yeah so uh, wine is a best stored uh, at a stable temperature of what's generally agreed to of 12.7 degrees Celsius. Um, dark, uh, no vibration, um, and uh, and higher humidity, so uh, 65 to 75 percent. And so when we began, uh, we tried to find a facility that was like that, and so we didn't have to build one right out of the gate because we didn't know how many customers there were going to be. And we wound up doing uh, an agreement with a fur coat storage vault of all strange things because fur coats and wine need the same thing. And so we began by storing people's wines at, on the lower level of a fur coat facility here in Toronto and grew the customer base until we got our own facility. So how did you get Iron Gate to where it is today? So uh, we started doing storage 
Uh, and as we were storing, and it took a long time to get customers uh, because they have to trust you, right? And so they're, it's like opening a bank. And so, but if you put a bank on the corner and said, come give me your, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, they'd go, you seem like a nice person, but I don't know about that. So we uh, began doing storage and then people would put wine in for storage and they trusted us and got to know us better. And they said, a couple people said, actually, what else can we do? And uh, so we began helping them with inventory in their homes and things like that, which caused us to look at what uh, things were in the market that would help them manage it. Different computer systems, um, different uh, things that uh, added to their enjoyment of collecting wine. Uh, then uh, we had customers who said, uh, I'm ha I've had a change in life of some kind, so I need to sell. What should I do? And that's when we began helping them sell wine uh, uh, outside of Canada or, well, there wasn't anything inside of Canada at the time. So it really just became looking at, uh, or looking at our customers, talking to them and trying to understand different ways we could help them so that we surrounded everything in the life of their wine. Speaking of the present day, um, let's talk a little bit about Iron Gates' services. You have a hand in retail, storage and inventory management. Can you tell me a little bit more about each service and what makes Iron Gate the industry leader in that space? Sure. So storage is exactly as you would think, right? You, you, you keep the, uh, your your wine in a, a perfect environment for us which is a subterranean uh, vault or an environmentally controlled vault is the best way to put it uh, two in Toronto uh, one in Buffalo New York uh, and so we store wine for people who store it because they've moved out of the country maybe they're renovating their home uh, or they've taken their big home and they've sold it and they've downsized into a smaller condo so they'll keep maybe 500 bottles in their condo and we'll keep a thousand bottles in storage and then they just keep replenishing it all the time. So that's storage and it's pretty straightforward. Through your inventory management system. Through our inventory system, yes. So <laughs> either through the inventory system that we keep on hand, uh, but there's also a home version of that inventory system that can manage the wine that they have in their home. And so, but if it's just stored with us, then they go online and they can see everything. They see uh, retail values that we price for them. They see drink dates and tasting notes and all that data is piled together so that they bring us 10, you know, or, or I shouldn't say 10 cases because that would be too small, but let's say 100 cases of something. Uh, we gather all that data for them, put it in the inventory system so that they know here's what I should be taking out and when. Okay, so a full management system. It kind of looks like when you go online, like a stock portfolio. Right, right. Okay, so it shows you a graph of how the value of that's been growing. It shows you. Um, uh, where you're long and where you're short. So I've gotten a pie graph, this much Bordeaux, this much drinking now, this That's all fantastic. that kind of stuff. A really amazing system. So, uh, so that's storage. On the inventory control side, as I mentioned, it is that system uh, that can be used in your home. So you don't need to store with us. Someone can go to your home, catalog everything, and it adds to the enjoyment of your wine because some people really geek out on it. For sure. Uh, but the other thing that it does is it makes sure that you never have anything that's sitting in the back of your cellar that you've just forgotten about. We've gone in as and that happens a lot. We've gone in catalog cellars and found wine that was really expensive wine. I'm talking multiple thousands of dollars a bottle and it's long past its prime. And that's unfortunate because they just forgot about it, you know, got shoved in a corner. So, uh, so there's practical as well as uh, enjoyment purposes from the inventory system. Then if you're looking to sell a wine uh, or a, a, a block of wine for a few reasons, you have too much, uh, you are 70 years old, you've got 5,000 bottles, you're pretty good at math, you go, <laughs> I drink three bottles a day until I'm 130, or maybe I'm just going to sell off some now. So I'm just going to keep the ones that I really like drinking, and I'm going to sell off the other ones. And that's very, very common. And so uh, we'll do that. And depending on the type of wine and depending on your needs and your application, we'll determine where that wine is best suited. So the three places that that could be are our uh, U.S. retail operation. So we would process the wine up here in Canada, ship it to Buffalo, New York, and sell it through irongate.wine, which is our uh, U.S.-based retail operation. Okay, so that's one. Right. right. Um, the second is for wines that 
don't traditionally sell as well uh, in Canada or through retail and you want it you want the transaction a little faster okay right, right. if I put it in retail it could sit on the shelf for a little while they don't usually sit for a long time but uh, you have wines that are very very expensive multiple thousands of dollars a bottle um, and those don't do well at auction in Canada and so we'll send those to Hong Kong where we have buyers that will purchase those outright uh, and so that's another option but that's really really at the highest end of the scale okay and then the third option, which uh, is a company that uh, we launched uh, just this year, is IrongateAuctions.com, which is based in Calgary, Alberta, where we have an auction uh, license and a liquor license, which allows us to sell wine at auction in Canada. So those are, those are the main services that we do. The other things that people come to us for that we don't do directly, but we know the best people in the business is transport. I'm moving to California. How do I get my wine down there? All the paperwork and keep it safe and all that stuff. Um, or insurance, right? Who can insure my seller at home? Um, or, or seller building, right? Who are the best guys to build a seller? I just built a, a brand new beautiful home on the bridal path, uh, but it doesn't have a wine cellar. I don't know that that exists. I don't think it does, right? No, it doesn't. Forget the bridal path reference. I built a brand new home someplace. And it doesn't have a wine cellar, uh, or I want to expand my wine cellar. So who are the best people to do it? Because every company uh, have their own unique specialty, right? Some which do very high-end, crazy, expensive, beautiful. Some that do more utility. So I guess what I'm saying is that uh, uh, the, 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 the things that we do, uh, retail, storage, auction, etc., uh, and where we don't, do it we know the best people in the industry who do it because we've been around a long time so going back to your online wine auctions uh you've already launched uh two successful has it been six successful online wine auctions well, you're right in both counts we've okay. launched two commercial auctions right which are our own company for-profit auctions where people are selling their their collections through us okay and then we've launched four charity auctions where a charity goes out and solicits wine from their donor base and then we sell it for them and all the money raised goes to that particular charity okay. so right and right on both counts and do you have one auction that's coming up or yeah, we have one. Uh, the one there's one going on as we, as of this writing that will finish on uh, June the eighth. Okay. Uh, for Jazz FM, then there'll be a hiatus for the summer where I'll let my staff take a break because since the fifteenth of March until the eighth of June, we have done six, which is in a ridiculous amount of wine auctions, particularly considering we hadn't done one before the fifteenth of March. For sure. We get back into it in September where we launch one for Big Brothers in Cal. Calgary, and then another commercial auction in September and another one in November. Okay, so for those watching that are interested in taking part, how can they go about doing that? Best thing to do is to go to irongateauctions.com and register. And if you're registered there, then you'll always get notification for everything that's coming up, everything that's happened, all the results, all that kind of stuff. That's the easiest thing to do so that you'll always know. We're going to switch things up a little bit and we're going to end with a bit of wine trivia and Q&A. Oh, look at this. Okay, good. Mm. Now, the first section, the first segment. <laughs> I'm gonna is, get tripped up. <laughs> you'll be fine. Okay, good. The first segment is called Pick the Wine. So they say that to become a wine connoisseur, there are 10 different regions and grapes that are a must try. And what I'm gonna do is name a regional grape, region and grape, and you're going to tell me your vineyard of choice. A region and grape, and uh, you'll, I'll tell you my vineyard of choice. Yes. Okay, producer of choice. Yes. Okay. All right, are you sure. ready? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, champagne. Which champagne? Uh, I, I mean, region, I, obviously, I, I would take a salon above all champagne. Cal Old champagne. Okay. California Chardonnay. Uh, Marcusson. Burgundy Pinot Noir. Uh, Rousseau. Napa Valley Cabernet. I'm not a big Napa Valley Cabernet. Oh, um, I, forgot. I don't like a lot of Napa Valley Cabernet. You're probably going to have to edit that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would say a Heights. Okay. Heights Cellars. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we'll uh, we'll smooth things over there. Yeah, please. Bordeaux. Uh, Chateau Palmer. French Chardonnay. 
Uh, a Burgundy Chardonnay would be a Cochetry. California Pinot Noir. Marcuson again. Chianti? Uh, Chianti, God, there's so many. Uh, I would probably take a, for a Tuscan wine, I'd take a Pergole Torte. Barolo. Uh, Barolo, I would go with um, Bourgogne. And Rioja. And Rioja, I would go with the Vega Cecilia. Okay, the second segment is called Word Association. So I'm going to name or describe something and you're going to tell me your, for, your first thoughts in five words or less. Ready? No, but carry on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, 19, uh, 1992 Screaming Eagle. Uh, world record. So the reason I say that is because we just sold a bottle of that for $17,635, if I'm not mistaken, which was a record for that wine. That is something that I definitely wanted to uh, make note to those who are watching. I and think we're going to open that incredible. up here today. I think that's incredible. No, we're not going to do that at all. <laughs> okay, next. Resveratrol. I'm sorry? Resveratrol. Resveratrol? Resveratrol. I don't know that word. So resveratrol is act actually the antioxidant found in red wine. Oh, good God. <laughs> <laughs> I hire people that know the stuff that's that deep. Hey, look, there's a learning experience good for, you. for me too. Yeah. So, 17 uh, years, I've never heard that word. Resveratrol, yeah. It's, uh, it's the antioxidant found in red grapes, and that's why they say a glass a day keeps the doctor away. Well, there you go. I didn't know that. <laughs> okay. Rudy Kurniawan. Kurniawan, and he is the, the uh, Indonesian that uh, was, is most known for wine fraud and the subject of the movie Sour Grapes. So he was a tremendous palate and a very gifted person. He just used his talent in the wrong way. Yes, you are correct there. All right, Judgment of Paris. Judgment of Paris was the uh, gentleman by the name of Stephen Spurrier who uh, created a competition between uh, French wine and California wine back in, if I'm not mistaken, 1974. Six. Uh, 1976. Oh. And, uh, oh, sorry, it was 1974 Chateau Montalena Chardonnay that won, which is why I'm thinking 74. Uh, so, uh, and it was California wines that won. Everybody got all mad, but it formed the basis of the, the Cal really formed the basis of the California wine industry and gave it some, put it on the map. For sure. And it's uh, portrayed in the movie Bottle Shock. Yes. Well, there you go. Okay. And finally, Petite Syrah. Uh, Drif. So Petite Syrah is a, a type of grape uh, that's um, more common as a blend in with a number of different wines. It's, it's certainly made as a wine on its own, but it's more typical uh, as a grape varietal that's a blend. Is that because of its like bold, bold uh, you know, dense tannins? Well, no, it just, um, it certainly has that, but it's yeah. just, it's, it's more widely known as a grape that blends with something as opposed to a grape just on its own. Okay, okay. All right, on to the wine trivia. Oh, Jesus. This. <laughs> <laughs> Don't hide your excitement. Okay, great. All right, this is uh, this segment is what it is. I'm gonna ask you some. I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> <laughs> this segment is uh, wine-related questions to test your knowledge on the subject. Oh, okay. Are you ready? No. <laughs> I heard a yes. Okay, you heard a yes. Okay. What was the most expensive bottle of wine ever sold? The most expensive wine ever sold. Um, it, well, it's hard because there was a there was an. Uh, uh, I'm going to say it was a 1945 Domaine de la Romani Conti Romani Conti. You, Am I right? You were right. Okay. It sold for. Do you do you remember how much? Uh, I'm going to say around 250,000. 558. Oh, I would have gotten it on sale. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I would have paid. Incredible, isn't it? Okay, what is the number one wine producing country in the world? Fra uh, wine producing in terms of total quantity? Yes, hectoliters. Oh, hectoliters. Um, 
Well, I don't know. I'm just going to say it's between France and Italy, so I'll say France. It's Italy. Is it? Ah. It's Italy at okay. twenty point eight million hectoliters. Second is actually Spain oh. at twenty point two, and France is third at thirteen point eight. Oh, there you go. Yep. Okay, so it's like some kind of wine jeopardy. <laughs> You're doing good. No. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, which country consumes the most amount of wine in the world by volume? By v total volume? Yeah. Oh, then I would have to think uh, maybe the United States? Correct. Absolutely the United States. Okay, approximately how many grapes go into a bottle of wine? I don't know. I have no, I honestly God, I have no idea. How many grapes? Yeah. I don't know. Well, guess. Uh, uh, 100. So it's actually between 600 to 800. Uh, I'm thinking a little bottle, so I'm thinking of an airplane bottle. <laughs> you see, you didn't coach see, that, that properly. Because I do, yeah, I, that's what I that's was thinking That's my of. fault. Yeah, it really is your fault. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How many grapes go into a bottle of wine? Why the hell does that? Well, you know. Okay. Now you do. I do, yeah. I won't remember it tomorrow, but I would do now. Okay, which country invented the corkscrew? Um, oh. Oh, um, Italy, I guess? I don't, I don't know who invented the corkscrew. England. Really? Yes. Huh, I wouldn't have guessed that. All right, last but not least. Okay. The last segment. Sure. The, the personal questions that have actually come through from our viewers. Okay. So, FYI, there are no wrong answers, so don't hold Unlike back. the trivia? <laughs> <laughs> All right, what is your most memorable wine experience? Um, probably uh, drinking, uh, we went to Burgundy and uh, cycled between the vineyards uh, and stopped for lunch uh, in one of the vineyards and opened a bottle of I don't know or remember or care what it was, but it was that moment where you're drinking where the wine is from in a beautiful setting um, uh, uh, with my wife and it was amazing and so uh, it, it to me it's rarely about that exact bottle although it's often that as well because we've had some amazing bottles with some very generous friends but it's usually the experience as a whole so that's what I would say it would be. What is the most expensive wine you've ever had? Uh, probably a um, uh, we had a, a, a Romani Conti, a DRC Romani Conti, uh, and a DRC Latash. Those would be the most expensive wines that we've had. At how much? Oh, I don't know. If you they, had to... I don't know. They'd be a lot. A they're, lot? Yeah, they're a lot. They're between five and $10,000 a bottle. Of all the wines you've ever had, which one would you pick if it was your last bottle? Uh, I would probably pick a white Burgundy. Uh, and I would wait. Why is it my last bottle? Well, it's Am not. I going to the gallows or something? <laughs> is it a? I just I want to know the, how this whole scenario plays out because it could impact what I'm going to choose. Well, right. Like I want a white wine if I'm go, having the death penalty, but I would want a red. You see, you have to pair your wine oh. with your last. No, I would say it would be a white Burgundy, and probably that would make it the best white Burgundy, which would likely be a Montrachet. And the last question: What is the most amount of wine you've consumed in a single sitting? Uh, well, first off, are you my sponsor? Um, <laughs> probably a, uh, we did a tasting with some great friends on the East Coast, and I think over the course of the evening, uh, we each would have consumed about three and a half to four bottles. So that's hard. It takes a seasoned professional. I don't for recommend sure. that. Don't try that at home. <laughs> I don't recommend that to the kids out there. I want to thank you again for taking the time to sit with me and yeah, thank share you. It's your been fun. Yeah. your stories. Now, in the spirit of sharing and uh, in the continuation of the great theme, since vodka is your spirit of choice, I'd like to present you with a limited edition oh my. of this white grape Ciroc vodka. Oh, beautiful. Thank you very much. You don't if, need to do that. <laughs> no, my pleasure. If time wasn't a scarce commodity, we'd probably crack it open and keep yeah, going. Yeah, we crush this, right? Between now and six o'clock. <laughs> well, no, that's beautiful. Thank you very much. That's very kind.
With that said, how can people get in touch with you if they're in need of any of the services uh, Iron Gate has to offer? Whether Best. it's you know your online auctions, sure. your inventory needs, your wine storage. We have a lot of different sites and a lot of different companies, but probably the best thing to do is start with irongatewine.com. And that talks about, that will lead you into the other businesses and it will tell you about all the different things that we do. Um, we're based in Toronto. You can call us. We can be emailed either at warren at irongatewine.com uh, or any, and I'll, I'll uh, um, if it's not me, then I'll make sure one of my terrific staff gets it and takes care of it. Well, there you have it. If you have any questions for Warren or myself, leave them in the comments. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button for your weekly dose of content, and I'll see you in the next one.